so my name is Dylan Beatty, and they have invited me to uh, come over here today to talk to you all about plain text. Um, now, a little bit about me, a little bit of introduction first. Uh, this is, let me just make sure I've got focus on the right window here. So this is me, uh, Dylan Beatty. I'm a uh, run a training company in London called Ursatile. I uh, used to do consultancy and stuff with the whole pandemic. I switched. Now, pretty much everything I do is online training about how to do uh, talks and uh, online presentations, .NET, distributed systems, architecture, all kinds of, of cool and interesting stuff like that. Um, I run uh, MVP with uh, Microsoft, the Developer Technologies Group. I run the .NET user group here in London. I also, I don't know if you've ever been on like LinkedIn and uh, looked around at all of the, the different adverts and things for different jobs and people saying we need a rock star developer, you know this? So I decided the best way to do this is to invent a programming language. So I invented a programming language called Rockstar so that everybody can be a rock star developer. Uh, you can get on and you can check that out at codewithrockstar.com. And uh, yeah, they have, invited me to come along here today to talk to you about plain text. And I know some of you are probably thinking, well, how do you get a 45-minute talk at a software conference about plain text? Um, well, it turns out there's no such thing as plain text. When somebody says, hey, send me a plain text file, what they normally mean is, send me a file I can open that doesn't need special software. Um, send me a file that I can just open in you know, Vim or Notepad or whatever. And for me to be able to send you a file that you, know, you can just open using whatever application you've got there, um, I need to know quite a lot about you. For starters, I need to know, uh, what year is this? What language are you speaking? What kind of computer system do you have? Are you running uh, Windows or Linux or Mac OS? All these kinds of details. So actually, plain text is really, really complicated. Um, so we're going to backtrack. We're going to start right at the beginning, go back to the earliest encoding systems, and look at how we ended up with this uh, complicated situation about text and all this kind of stuff. Now. Pretty much all we invented uh, writing. You know, human beings about five thousand years ago, we came up with this way of expressing ideas using written information, and we invented alphabets and stuff. But it got really interesting about one hundred and fifty years ago when we decided to mix writing and electricity, and we came up with the first telegraph systems. Now, telegraphs have the same problem as every other kind of information processing. Almost all the systems that we work on and that we, you know, we use today. We got to solve three problems. How do you get useful information into the technology? This is called encoding. Once it's there, what do you do with it? This is information processing. And finally, once you've processed it, how do you get the information back out the other side? That's decoding. And when it works, somebody else, they get some results. They can do interesting things. They can make decisions with that information. Now, the earliest, earliest text encoding system in history was probably this thing. This is a Cook and Wheatstone telegraph system. It's used in England in the 1830s. And it's probably the first instance anywhere in history of using electricity to transmit text. Now, this system, it used five wires. And it used the system of little needles mounted on magnetic coils. And the way that you could read and write this, they didn't want to invent any complicated encoding systems uh, because they wanted to be able to sell this to people with no special training, mostly people who worked on railways. So they came up with this idea. If you look closely at one of these telegraph systems, it actually looks like this. And what those five wires do is they create a circuit through two of these needles and they deflect the needles. And so two needles deflect and then you read where those needles intersect and that tells you which letter it is that's being transmitted. Now, the interesting thing, this was electromechanical. You know, there was no kind of technology or signals processing going on here. But they actually invented, this is the first text encoding system that was ever used anywhere in the world. And it's a weird encoding system because if you think about it, you've got these five needles. And each needle can be positive, negative, or zero. So the first text encoding system in history was a five-symbol trinary encoding system. You send in plus minus and or yeah, plus minus and you read that off and that tells you what letter came through at the other end of that system. Now, the problem with the Cook and Wheatstone system is these five wires. Five wires was expensive. And this is when, you know, there was no infrastructure, no phone network, no fiber optic. To make a telegram, you had to buy 20 miles or 20 kilometers of wire times five and run it along the railway tracks. 
And this was expensive, and if anything went wrong with one of these wires, the system stopped working. So across the other side of the Atlantic, a guy called Samuel Morse was trying to figure out a way of building a telegraph that only used one wire by using different encoding systems to send that information. And uh, he came up with, well, a lot of people think that he came up with this. Samuel Morse actually invented an earlier version of this code that uh, was then it was a German guy called Friedrich Gerke who turned it into the code we recognize today with one dot, one dash, and, and gaps in the, the spacing. That's Morse code. And there was a technology conference in 1865. Yeah, they used to have tech conferences in 1865 in Paris where they adopted this standard, this one here, as international Morse code. Now, there is a rule of technology that says you can change your system as much as you like until people start using it. But once a lot of people are using your technology, you're never going to be able to change it ever again because it's too difficult to make changes. And Morse code was hugely successful. Within about 10 years, 1875, pretty much every country in the world that had telegraph systems were using Morse code. So the whole world spoke Morse code, except North America, because they're special. Um, and that meant you couldn't change it because nobody was going to buy a telegraph system. They tried to create better systems, but nobody wanted a telegraph system that didn't work with Morse code. And it took about 100 years before this got changed because eventually, about 100 years later, the 1950s, 1960s, digital computers came along. And the thing about digital computers is Morse code doesn't work well with digital systems. They have a whole different set of requirements. But also, if you can come up with the right kind of encoding, you can do things much, much faster with a digital computer. And so there was a good reason to do it. There was a reason to change. Now, in 1960, almost exactly 100 years, 1963, uh, a body called the American Standards Association, which is now called ANSI, the American Standards Association published a draft of a thing called the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, ASCII. They tweaked it a little bit. In 1968, they published the final specification, and we're still using that spec today, 50, 52 years later. Um, now, asking programmers about ASCII is like asking fish about water. You know, we're surrounded by ASCII. Our whole lives, all of us have used ASCII since we started programming. A lot of us never stop to think about what ASCII actually is and where it came from and how it works. Now, there's two things you got to remember about ASCII. It was designed to work on mechanical teleprinting machines like this one. And when it was first ratified, a lot of places, they still used punch cards to store data. Some places had tape. A lot of computer programming was still done using punch cards. So you've got to remember those to make sense of it. Now, we're going to go on a little guided tour here of the whole ASCII system and the whole ASCII character set. And what we're going to do is we're going to break it down, and we're going to look at it one block at a time. So ASCII is a seven-bit encoding. First one, zero, top one is 127. So there's 128 characters available in basic ASCII. The first block looks like this. Now, a lot of this stuff now is just they are historical relics that nobody uses anymore. But some of them we still use today. So this character zero, the null character, all the zeros, byte full of zeros. Um, if you've done any programming with C, C++, you know about null terminated strings. That's what this is. Byte full of zeros means you've reached the end of a string if you're using C style languages. Um, start of heading, start of text, we don't use those. No one's used those for years. But the next one. Now, on the original teletype machines, if you look at your keyboard in front of you right now, there is a keyboard on it called Control, CTRL. And Control was used to send control codes. And if you wanted to send one, you pressed Control A. And if you wanted to send the second one, start of text, you pressed Control B. And if you wanted to send end of text, you'd send press Control C. Now, the interrupt, if your .NET program has an infinite loop and it's spinning and you go press Control-C to end it, you're using a control code that was designed to interrupt a teletype machine in 1963. I think that's pretty cool. Um, end of text, end of transmission, inquiry, acknowledgment, we don't work with those. But the next one, Bell, try this. Open a Windows terminal and type echo, space, press Control-G, press Enter, and your Windows computer will go ping because bell was the code used to sound a bell, ring a mechanical bell, and that still works today.
Now we get into an interesting block. We got backspace, horizontal tab, line feed, vertical tab, form feed, carriage return. And some of you probably have come across this whole idea about carriage returns and new lines. And you ever stop to think about why we have this weird situation? So here is a mechanical teletype machine. Now, the thing you've got to realize about these teletype machines is they had a thing called a carriage. This is the print head, moves backwards and forwards across the page, and they had paper on a roller, and you could control these things separately. So when you got to the end of a line, you would send a carriage return to put the carriage back to the beginning of the line, and then you'd send a line feed to move the paper one line. But you didn't have to use these things together. You could print a line of text, and then you could send a carriage return, and then you could send the same line of text again, and you got bold. That's how they did bold on mechanical teleprinters. And there were a couple of different companies who thought, well, that's kind of useful, like being able to send carriage returns independently. And then, you know, you send another new line and another new line. Now, way back in the dawn of time, before Unix, there was a system called Multics, 1960s. And Multics was the first system ever that used device drivers. And so the people who created Multics were like, well, we don't need a new line. Like carriage return on its own is useful, but a new line on its own doesn't really do anything because it just moves the printer. You've also got to move back. Why don't we just use new line as shorthand? And then in the device driver, we'll translate that to next line and go back to the beginning. And so multics slash n meant go to the start of the new next line. And Multics was used, it inspired Unix, and Unix inspired Linux, and Mac OS, and Android. And so all those systems today still use slash n. But Windows, on Windows, to put in a new line, you need a carriage return and then a line feed, backslash r, backslash n. Now, the reason for that is that Windows 10 had to be compatible with Windows 8, which was compatible with Windows 7, or Windows XP, and Windows 2000, and Windows 95, which had to work on MS-DOS, which came from an earlier operating system called CPM. And CPM CPM was built to work on mini computer terminals that didn't have any idea of device drivers. So you had to interface with them direct. And so, you know, here we are 50 something years later, the Linux crowd are like backslash N is a new line and the Windows crowd are backslash R backslash N. Now, of course, .NET, we've solved this problem mostly because we have, hey, environment.newline. And that most of the time just works with whatever's running on whatever platform you're working on. Let's have a look at the next block of ASCII here. So we've got this. Now, there's a couple of interesting things in this block. One, if you look at the punctuation marks that made it into ASCII. Now, ASCII has 127 characters, and it was designed in America, in the United States of America in the 1960s. There weren't that many more characters used in America in the 1960s. They did have to lose some punctuation. ASCII just has single quotes and double quotes. It doesn't have like opening and closing quotes, what you sometimes see now talked about as smart quotes. It's just got this one dash, minus, hyphen, whatever. Now, in typesetting, actually a minus sign and a dash and a hyphen are all different things. ASCII went, yeah, we can just get away with one. So there are some compromises there in the design, but actually not very many. The decimal numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. What's interesting about these is if you look at the binary encodings here, 0 is 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. 1 is 0, 0, 0, 1. So if you want to do strings to integers in ASCII, you just chop off the first four bits. You do a, a bit mask with it. And if you want to turn integers back into strings, you just put 0011 onto the beginning. So you do like a bitwise or with the value 48. And so this gives us a very, very efficient way of going strings to integers and integers back to strings and converting these, these values back again. Now, the next two blocks, these are the ones where we see the Latin alphabet letters that we recognize. And even here, there's some clever things. You look at the uppercase A and the lowercase A here, um, they only differ by one bit. Every letter in ASCII has an uppercase and a lowercase that differ by one bit. So you can do a case insensitive string comparison by just ignoring that one bit. You want to turn lowercase to uppercase, you flip that bit. A lot of very, very easy things to do on the old 4-bit and 8-bit processors that were around when you know, ASCII started, started evolving and stuff. Um, the last thing in here that's interesting is ASCII code 127, which is another control code. It's called DEL, delete. Now, do you know why DEL is 127? Well, 127 in binary is 111111. It's all the ones. And if you print that onto a punch card, you can't erase data on a punch card. You can't paste cardboard back into the holes. The only way to get rid of it is to punch through all the other holes so that the data becomes gone, deleted. And so the ASCII delete code is the code that says, hey, write this onto a punch card, and you get this string of, the, of, of, of ones there, this thing here. There it is. Yep. Um, and it'll wipe the punch card. 
So there we go. And we're still using that today. Now, 1968, the ASCII uh, consortium, the American Standards Association, goes, hey, ASCII is finished. 127 characters. It's all you're ever going to need. And the rest of the world goes, what? We, we can't work with this. Now, for some cultures, you know, uh, Arabic, Chinese, Korean, ASCII was just a complete non-starter. There's nothing in there that's useful to it. But for a lot of cultures, particularly in Western Europe, ASCII was kind of almost good enough. Now, you know, I'm, I'm British, but I grew up in Zimbabwe, where we, uh, when I was a kid, I spoke English and we used dollars and cents. So I didn't know there was any problem with ASCII until I moved to the UK when I was 10 years old. Um, and I discovered that ASCII does not include this, which is the pounds currency sign. So in the UK, ASCII was almost good enough, but you couldn't use it to do price lists and things. And of course, what a lot of people around the world did is they looked at ASCII and they went, well, hang on, we've got 256 characters in, a, in one byte. You know, we can go from 00 to FF and ASCII's only using the first half. And they're like, hello, hey, is anyone using, could we use this bit to do our own thing? Which was a brilliant idea. The problem is it's a brilliant idea that lots of people had at the same time. And so everybody went, yay, we're going to build our own variation on the ASCII system. And we got a Bulgarian ASCII and a Russian and a Ukrainian and a Chinese and a Greek and also different vendors. So we had, a, a, these were called code pages, an extension into the second half of ASCII. Code page was a rule that said, this is what all these other ASCII codes mean. And they were different for different languages, different cultures, different computers. So if you had a document written using a uh, Russian code page on a PC, it wouldn't work on a mainframe. Russian code page wouldn't work with a Greek code page, all these kinds of things. Now, one of the most popular code pages, you probably, some of you may even recognize this. Uh, this was code page 437, which shipped with the IBM PC. And uh, code page 437, it defined a bunch of interesting characters, box drawing characters, uh, most Western European accents. It had about half of the Greek alphabet. This is the half that's used in physics, not you couldn't actually write Greek with this because it didn't have enough letters. Um, they also tried to use some of those old control codes to do useful characters for drawing little games and stuff. Um, if you've ever seen an IBM PC crash really hard and it starts beeping and showing you smiley faces, that's what's happened, is it's interpreting control codes using code page 437 and you're just getting garbage on the screen. Now, take a look at this character set here. Now, so you, I'm sure most of you watching this, you recognize those letters, but you're thinking, well, what order is this thing in? You know, a big day, that's not alphabetical order in, in Russian or Belarusian or Ukrainian. Um, this is a brilliant code page. This is code page 878. Now, one of the problems with early encoding systems is a lot of software and network equipment didn't work with eight bits. So you'd take a word like uh, Priet and you would encode it using the American standard encoding system for the Cyrillic alphabet and you'd get this. And then that would turn into eight bit bytes and then the seventh bit would fall off because of some bad email software or something. And then you would decode what you had left and you'd get nonsense. And yeah, this doesn't make any sense. So this encoding, code page 878, is the Code of Mena Informatia Vosimbit code, 8-bit uh, information coding system. And the way that this worked, it was based on how they did Russian in Morse code, based not on the shape of the letter and the alphabetical letter, but based on the English letter that it kind of sounded like. So you take Pruviet with KOI8, you get an encoding, you get a bunch of bits, the 8th bit gets chopped off by your bad email software, you decode it back again, and you get Pruviet, which is not Russian, but you can kind of see what it says. It's an information preserving encoding system, which I think is actually really clever. Now, all these different companies, cultures, countries, they all come up with all their own code pages. And by the end of the 1980s, there are literally, this is from, from Wikipedia, um, don't read it, but this is just some of the code pages that were out there and existed. But as we started to you know, develop the internet and we were starting to plug different computers and networks and connect people together, we needed a better system than just having hundreds of different code pages. We needed a unique coding system and that's where we get this idea of Unicode. The Unicode project started in 1988. The Unicode Consortium, which is the nonprofit body that controls it, was established in 1991. And their mission statement was to provide a single consistent way to represent each letter and symbol needed for all human languages across all computers and devices. Now, 
This is a big deal. Let's break that down a little bit. First of all, a single way to represent every letter and symbol. So they needed to find every letter, every used in ev every alphabet, not just the ones that were still being used, but also things like Egyptian hieroglyphics and ancient Sumerian, so that Unicode could be used to digitize archaeology and historical documents. All human languages across all computers and devices. That means it's got to be free. It's got to be documented. It's got to be easy to implement. No licensing restrictions, none of that kind of stuff. Um, so let's break it down a little bit more. Single consistent way. Now, what is a letter? Like, here are, here are two strings. Take a look at these for a second. Do you think these are the same? What about now? Now, they look the same, but they're not the same. These are, you know, Horosho and Exoplanet. When you look at it like this, they look identical. But then when you add some more, you see that they're actually different sounds in different languages. How about these two? Now, you know, in, in this case, it's the same shape that represents the same sound that we use in almost every language in, in Europe. You know, the Slavic languages, the Romance languages, English, Belarusian, Russian, Ukrainian, French, Spanish, Swedish, all use this T to see. So how many letters is this? Is this two different kinds of T or just one? Um, Unicode had to solve this. They had to figure it out. And, you know, it gets more complicated than that. Uh, take a look at this word here. Now, I'm British. I, uh, you know, I, I, I speak English. Uh, good morning. This is the BBC. London is the capital of Great Britain. And so when I travel internationally, I see words like this, uh, which is Norwegian. And I look at it and I'm like, I don't recognize those. But hey, that's all right. If I ignore them, it's going to be fine. I can still pronounce this. And so I say, uh, Hafona. And everyone laughs because that's not, this is a, <laughs> I'm going to try this, a Hafona, I think. It's the Norwegian word for hairdryer. And if I read it in English, the pronunciation is completely mangled. Because in Norwegian, these are different letters of the alphabet. They're not just an A and an O with something extra on them. And, you know, everybody laughs, and I buy a round of drinks, and it's all fine. And, you know, sometimes this is no big deal. But to make things even more complicated, we got this long, complicated history of designers and typesetters borrowing stuff from other languages. Let, let's meet a couple of people here. Um, so this is Francois Borda, who is a French archaeologist. And this is Motley Crue, American rock band from Los Angeles. And once upon a time, Francois the archaeologist went to the Motley Crue concert. Now, this sentence is definitely in English, but these characters here do not appear in the English alphabet because we got these weird conventions. Um, in English, if we write a French person's name, we use the accents to write their name as if it was in French. This A and E joined together, that's an old fashioned typesetting convention that some people still use for certain letters. Um, and then the O and the U in Motley Crue, this is a thing called the heavy metal umlaut, which is rock bands from Britain and America who only speak English, put umlauts on things because they think it looks cool. Uh, the first time Motley Crue went to Germany on a tour, the audience were all shouting, Muetle Crue, Muetle Crue, because that's how you pronounce these letters with umlauts, and they had no idea what's going on. Now, you know, sometimes this is no big deal. Making Motley Crue look stupid is not important. They looked pretty stupid to begin with, but sometimes it can cause all kinds of problems. Uh, some of you might know this guy. This is, this is Magnus. He's a Swedish MVP and, and a .NET developer and uh, does all, all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, and uh, Magnus's name is Magnus. No, Magnus's name is not Magnus Martinson. Magnus's name is Magnus Mortensen because he has this Swedish letter with an A. A couple of years back, uh, Magnus is going to the U.S. for a conference, and he got into a little bit of trouble going through uh, the border. Now, he has a Swedish passport. And on his Swedish passport, his name is Mortensen, and the Swedish government says that if you have to spell this A with a circle on top of it in ASCII, you use two A's. The company who booked his airline ticket, they didn't follow the Swedish rules, they followed the American rules, so they just came out with this. Now, what do you think happens when you try and get into the United States with a passport that doesn't match the name on your airline ticket? Yeah, there were some interesting questions. He was he was all right in the end. Um, but, you know, these kinds of things matter. We need to understand not just how do you encode text, but what does it mean if we get it wrong? Now, have a look at this letter here. This is the sir from Francois, our archaeologist friend and Motley Crue fan. Um, now, there are two different ways in Unicode that we can write this character. One is Unicode says, yep, that's a letter. We'll give it a code point. This is what the Unicode codes are called. We'll give it 00C7. But we can also take the letter C and we can add this thing, code point 0327, which is a combining cedilla, which will 
combine with any other character to add this accent to it. So now we end up with two characters which look the same and behave the same and sound the same, but are they the same? You know, are these equivalent? Um, now, the great thing about these combining characters is you can add more than one because the combining character just says, take whatever you've already got and add some more stuff at the top or at the bottom or, or enhance it. And so we can take like a Z and we can add one of these and one of these and one of these and one of these. And some of you may know what this is going to end up as, because if you hang around on uh, certain kinds of Stack Overflow questions, you will know about Zalgo text which looks really weird and freaky, but this is just normal text with all the different Unicode combining characters all stacked up on top of it. But if we get two things like Francois and Francois with a combining character, are they the same? Should we treat these as the same string? Uh, what about if it's not just a, a character? What about if we actually have two different letters in our alphabet? That Because the C in, in France, that's just a, a letter C with an accent. That's not a letter in the French alphabet. Um, in the Cyrillic alphabet, there is a, what's it called? E, the, the, the short E. But Unicode lets you make one of these by taking a normal E and, and putting this brave accent on top of it. So are these strings the same or are they different? You know, Now, Unicode doesn't say they're the same difference. It says, well, look, I'm going to give you a bunch of options to choose from. And these are called normalization forms. Now, uh, there's some code here. I'll drop in a link to this in the, in the chat afterwards. So you can go and play around with this stuff. But in .NET, the four normalization forms we've got, basically there's a, what's called a composition and a decomposition form. Composition means mash everything together into the smallest number of code points. Decomposition means break it back out into characters plus separate accents and combining characters. And then there are two different nodes. There's what's called a canonical equivalency, means these are exactly the same. And there is compatibility equivalency, which means these mean the same thing, even though they're not identical. So uh, let's, I've got this little comparison function here where I'm just going to go through and compare the strings and then compare them with these four different normalization forms. Um, so I'm going to try it on this uh, Drogoi one, and I'm going to try it on Drogoi and then uh, Drogoi with the e koya stuck on the end. Um, and when I compare those, the strings aren't equal, but Unicode says under all the normalization things, these are basically the same string. That's how the rules of Unicode work. Now, have a look at a different example. Um, in Unicode, there's a bunch of codes for Latin English letters in circles. So we've got hello in circles, and we've got hello not in circles. Now, if we normalize these, under the composed and decomposed forms, they are not equal. But under the, uh, the K here stands for compatible, by the way, so they don't get it mixed up with C. So KC, compatible composed, and KD, which is compatible decomposed, they are considered to be the same. So these four normalization forms, you're doing anything with comparing strings in Unicode, it's really important to figure out you know, which normalization form makes sense for what it is you're trying to do. All right, let me tell you a story. Uh, about four years ago, I was at work one morning. Uh, my team was looking after a bunch of .NET web servers, dynamic CRM, uh, web-facing stuff, some SQL Server databases. And one of my team comes over to my desk and he says, dude, I think we've been hacked. Now, you know, I hear this all the time in IT. I've been hacked. No, you haven't. Caps lock is on. I've been hacked. No, you haven't. That's just a spam email. I've been hacked. But this guy is one of the best InfoSec people I've ever worked with in my whole career. So when he comes over and says, we've been hacked, I stop. And I say, Chris, what's up? He's like, why do you think we've been hacked? He says, there's Chinese in the Windows event log. And I remote onto the box. This is our Dynamics CRM server. And sure enough, there is Chinese in the Windows event log. And I think, all right, this might be bad. So I say, one of the team, you go and uh, check through all the database records, see if there's any trace of these Chinese characters, see if you can find them in the database somewhere. Maybe it's a SQL injection attack. Uh, someone else check the firewall log, see if there's anything weird. Um, and of course, when you're managing an incident, if you've got a really good team, you end up with nothing to do. So what I do is I go on Twitter and I say, ah, oh, the incoming tabular data stream, blah, 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 Chinese. It's going to be one of those days. And the thing I love about Twitter is it's full of smart people. And I immediately get one response saying, oops, it looks like a Unicode mapping error. And I get another one that says, yeah, the low bits are all null. This looks like UTF-16 LE being mistaken for Unicode 16 uh, BE. And I think, what? What, what, is, what is UTF-16? What is LE? What is BE? Because that, my friends, that was the day I learned about Unicode character encoding systems. Now, UTF-16 is used on Windows. It's used in Java. It's used in some JavaScript engines. And what it says is that every character is stored as two bytes. 
16 bits. Every single one of these, uh, so this is the D is an ASCII 44, so 0044. Every character is exactly 16 bits wide. Now, this gives us a lot of space, gives us like 65,000 characters worth of space. Um, but when you have two bits, you know, who says which one is the important bit, which one is the big bit, which one's the little bit? And so we have BE is big Endian little uh, Unicode, and LE is little Endian Unicode. And what happens if they get mixed up? Well, actually, in .NET, it's pretty easy to just take a string, encode it as big Endian Unicode, decode it as little Endian, and see what you get out. And if we take this word delete, and we flip all those bits around, and then we decode it again, we get this. We get some rather familiar looking Chinese characters. Now, obvious next question, why has the big Endian, little Endian flipped in our CRM server? Well, it hadn't. What had happened, we eventually worked out, we had a network switch that was failing. And every once in a while, that network switch would drop one byte just disappear from the data stream. And what happened when one byte went missing is all the rest of the bytes kind of got moved over by eight bits, one byte. But the, the decoding frame didn't get reset. And so our Windows event log was seeing all this data streaming in from CRM. And it was just logging what it saw according to UTF-16. And that's where we got Chinese in the event logs. Now, there is another system. There's UTF-16. Uh, there's another one called UTF-32. Now, the problem with UTF-16 is that if you're doing a lot of stuff with ASCII, or you know the, the ASCII we talked about at the beginning, it's really inefficient because half of all those is going to be a bunch of zeros. Um, UTF-32 uses four bytes for every character. So if you've got a lot of stuff going on with ASCII, it's really inefficient. And the thing you've got to remember, you know, like if you go onto a, a, a Russian or Belarusian or uh, Arabic or Korean language website, say, the, the human readable text is in Russian or Belarusian or Korean or Arabic, but all of the HTML is ASCII. All of the CSS is ASCII. The JavaScript is ASCII. Source code files are ASCII. So even internationalized documents, they still tend to have a lot of ASCII going on, which means storing ASCII using 16 or 32 bits is really inefficient. Uses too much memory, too much bandwidth, too much disk space, too much all kinds of things. Now, they also have a problem that they are not backwards compatible. UTF-16, if you open that in uh, old fashioned text editor, you get D and then clink, and then E and then clink, and then because it doesn't know what the other bits in here mean. So it doesn't look particularly good. But what if there was an encoding that was completely backwards compatible with ASCII all the way back to 1968 that allowed us to encode up to two to the 32. So we're talking probably a couple hundred million code points for Unicode. There is, it exists. It is called UTF-8 and it is absolutely brilliant. So first rule of UTF-8 says anything that starts with a zero is seven bit ASCII, the same as it's been for 50 years. Anything that starts with a one is part of a multi-byte sequence. Anything starts with one, one, count the ones. That's how many bytes you've got to read here. So if you've got one, one, this is a two-byte sequence. We know it's a two-byte sequence because it starts with one, one, zero, and then one, zero at the start of any byte, that is a continuation byte. One, 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 zero, three ones, three-byte sequence. One, 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 zero, four bytes, four-byte sequence. Now, UTF-8 is not perfect. For certain characters, it requires three bytes instead of two. And um, its biggest problem from a kind of data processing perspective is because a single letter of an alphabet can be one byte or two bytes or three bytes or four bytes, you can't tell the length of your string by counting the bytes. You actually need to go through it looking for the characters. But if you drop in the middle of a string in uh, UTF-8 and you don't know where you are, you just backtrack until you see a 1-1. One, one. And that means you know, you're at the start of a byte. That means you're at the start of a, a character sequence. UTF-8 is brilliant. It's really elegant. It's really clever. Um, something like 95% of the pages on the World Wide Web now are encoded with UTF-8. It's an incredibly brilliant, successful protocol. Um, it was designed, <laughs> it's designed on a placemat in a diner in New Jersey in 1992 by Rob Pike and uh, Ken Thompson, both of whom you may have heard of. They're you know, influential people who've done lots of great work in computer science. Um, and yeah, UTF-8 is just this wonderful coding standard that works across all kinds of things. Now, why do we need all these code points? Well, it turns out that the Unicode Consortium's mission statement, all the symbols used in any human language, um, they, we've made their job more difficult because while they've been working away trying to fix that, we have been inventing new languages. 
And some of you are thinking, no, we haven't, but we have. You know, There is a completely new language with a completely new alphabet that did not exist in 1991 when the Unicode Consortium was founded. Um, and it's not just some weird, obscure, like science fiction language. It's a real language that all of you probably use today without realizing it. Um, it's the language called emoji. The first set of emoji were invented in Japan in 1999. Uh, Docomo was the Japanese mobile phone company. They were building a platform called iMode to do mobile internet. And they came out with the first set of emoji that they thought people were going to use to do weather reports and traffic forecasting and all these kinds of things. Um, this took off in a big way in Japan, which meant in 2008, when Apple launched iPhone in Japan, they had to support emoji, otherwise no one was going to buy it. Once it became part of the iPhone emoji spread around the world. It became hugely successful, and people started asking questions. Why is there emoji for sushi, but not for tacos? Uh, why are the, the doctors and the chefs and the police officers in emoji all white guys? I mean, they weren't white. They were that kind of yellow Simpsons cartoon color. Um, but you know, all the police officers were men, and all the pilots were men, and all these kind of things. And people ask questions like, why is the flag of Israel in emoji, but the flag of Palestine isn't? And it got quite complicated. Now. In 2015, Unicode took a massive step towards diversity because they introduced the way of changing the skin color, skin tone used on most of the people emoji. The way they did it's actually really clever. Um, you remember we talked about combining characters, like a C with a Cedilla. What they did is they said, all right, we'll take this, this code point here, the uh, uh, 1F44D, thumbs up, um, and we'll add an accent character that is medium dark skin tone. So if you combine these two characters together, you get that. Now, this is brilliant, and this works on almost all of the emoji in the character set using a convention that was designed as part of Unicode 1.0 all the way back in the 90s before emoji even existed. And every year now, they keep adding loads of new emoji. And all these new emoji have a whole bunch of different options and configurations because human beings are a really, really diverse bunch of people. But if we tried to create a code point for every possible combination of uh, skin tone, gender, relationship, occupation, all all these different kinds of combinations, we'd run out of address space really quickly, even with four bytes of encoding. So they used another legacy feature to the rescue. Um, say we want the Unicode glyph of female astronaut. Well, there is no such code point, but what there is, is there is the woman emoji. Then there is a thing called a zero width joiner, switch which is a Unicode instruction that says, join these th things together to make another one. And there is an emoji for rocket. So the female astronaut emoji does not have a code point. It is a set of three code points. It's called a zwidge sequence, zero with joiner sequence. Woman, zwidge, rocket. If you want a female astronaut with dark skin, boom, woman, add the skin tone accent modifier, plug in the zwidge, put rocket on the end of that. That's how we get all these different combinations. Now, flags are a really interesting one because there's actually three different ways in emoji to create flags. The flag of Belarus is defined in the emoji character set because there is a block of Latin letters called the regional symbol in indicator symbol letters. And if you stick two of these together, it says this is an ISO country code. Go and look it up, draw that flag. England is not a country according to ISO. It does not have an ISO country code. So to draw the flag of England, we use a different technique, which is a black flag. Now, in the original Unicode spec, there was a bunch of things called tags, which were designed to, to decorate a character to explain what language it was in. No one used them. So in 2010, they were removed from the emoji spec and they were deprecated. But then people started using them to do things like, well, this black flag is GB. ENG, Great Britain, England. And so in 2015, they were put back into the uh, Unicode specification. So this is how you do tagging. And you can do this for England, Scotland, Wales. And I think the flag of Texas is in there as well now. And if you want to do the pride flag, this one is a zwidge just like we did for the female astronaut. This is a white flag, a zero with joining character, and the rainbow emoji. So we got three different techniques here, all used to create flags. Now, if you try this on Microsoft Windows, you'll notice that on Windows, the pride flag, the transgender flag, and the pirate flag work, but none of the other flags do. Now, you might be wondering why that is. Does anyone recognize this? It's the flag of Taiwan. Now, Taiwan is an independent country, or is it? 
Taiwan says it is. Taiwan says it is a country called the Republic of China, not to be confused with the People's Republic of China, which is the country across the other side of the, of the, the Taiwan Sea. Um, now, if you go into your iPhone, and I did this yesterday to get these screenshots, you can type the flag of Taiwan. Go into your regional settings and set your phone's location to China mainland. And then when you go back and look again, the Taiwan flag has disappeared. It's not there. You can't type it. It's missing from the keyboard, and it will not render anymore. Because in China, the flag of Taiwan will get you in all kinds of trouble. And for whatever reason, Apple decided it just wasn't worth it. Um, now, on Microsoft Windows, there are no country flag emoji at all. If you look at my profile on Twitter, I got this thing, the, the EU flag. Now, it displays there because Twitter's web software translates them from emoji uh, codes into graphics and puts them in the web stream. But if I go to edit my profile, that falls back to a Windows text block and the flag disappeared. So there you go. Regional flags, three different ways of doing it. But then you get into a whole bunch of politics about whether Taiwan is a country and whether the people whose market you're trying to sell into agree with you or not. And so character encoding, plain text, suddenly gets really complicated and political. And we're on the home stretch. The last thing that I want to show you, we've looked at all these languages, symbols, ways of combining information to put certain kinds of shapes on a screen. But there's one more thing I want to tell you about, how to get the text back out at the other end. Now, font rendering and stuff, that's a whole topic all on itself. But there's a little neat detail I want to share with you. If you look at the logo for my company, my company logo looks like this. And if you look closely, you'll see that the T and the I are actually joined together in a single character. Now, that's not Unicode. This is just ASCII text, U-R-S-A-T-I-L-E. That's all that's going on here. This is a thing called a ligature. And a ligature is a font feature where this font, this is Leto, is the, the house font that I use for all my stuff. That has a rule that says if you see a T and an I together, replace them with this symbol, which I think looks pretty nice. Now, the great thing about ligatures is that they work with any kind of text file if your operating system supports them. Have a look at this chunk of code here. What language is this? Now, it looks kind of weird. We got these little, you know, uh, pointy uh, symbol. Like, you look at this one. Can I reach that far across? Oh, no, I've run out of green screen. But we got this one down here. You know, have a look at that. And we've got this arrow shape in here. What are they? Well, they're just ASCII. They are regular ASCII rendered using a special font. That font is called Fira Code, and you can go out and you can download it and you can install it in your IDE, and it replaces lots of common programming symbols with these cool little glyphs like triple equals and equals not equal to and slashes and stuff. But that's really cool, and it's possible thanks to ligatures, which is this, this font feature, nothing to do with the code at all. It's just how it gets displayed on your screen. And the last thing I want to wrap up, we have about two minutes left, is a couple of years ago, when I visited uh, Belarus for the first time to speak at .NET Summit back in, I think this was in 2017, um, I was out, you know, I'd never been to, to Belarus. I was in Minsk, and I was walking around taking pictures and looking at stuff, and I had this weird moment. I was like, I can't read Cyrillic. You know, I, I've learned a little bit since then. At the time, I couldn't read it at all. So I couldn't read Russian or Belarusian, um, and I couldn't read the signs, and I couldn't read the notices, and I couldn't read the restaurant menus, but I could read all the cars license plates. And I thought this was interesting. And I went, I did a little bit of digging and, you know, I discovered this, this fascinating thing. Now, in 1968, there was a thing called the Vienna Convention on International Road Traffic that made a set of rules that and one of those rules was if you want to drive your car internationally, you are only allowed to use Latin letters on your license plate. Now, this is 1968 when uh, Belarus and Ukraine and, and Russia were all part of the Soviet Union and Soviet license plates didn't use Latin, they used Cyrillic. Now, it turns out that <laughs> apparently if you wanted to drive your car out of the Soviet Union, one, you had to get travel permits and all kinds of complicated paperwork. Um, but when you got to the border, they would give you temporary license plates, which were different, <clears throat> and you had to give them back when you got home. Now, when Soviet Union uh, you know, ended in the 1990s and uh, all the various republics became independent, a couple of company, countries, like uh, so one, most of them got a new car registration system, and uh, Belarus and Ukraine both got this, the, the E character, and they started using that again because it's part of their alphabets, even though it wasn't in Russian. And I did a little bit of digging, and I discovered this. If you take the Cyrillic alphabet that's used in Belarus and Ukraine, and you plot it next to the Latin alphabet, and then you circle the bits which appear in both alphabets, you get the exact set of characters which you are allowed to use on Belarusian license plates. 
and Ukrainian license plates. And, you know, I looked at these letters and I thought, I wonder if I can make a, a phrase out of those. And so I, I played around with it and I, I came up with a um, uh, and I was like, mm, maybe not. And Tomsky uh, Navech. Or uh, what about a Sotnik Vercham? And I, you know, as you can tell, I don't speak Belarusian. Now, I, I think, based on Google Translate, uh, one of these is a Chrome advisor. One of them means Tomsk is upstairs, and the other one is like a, a, someone riding on a horseback. But I thought, let's switch back to English, and we'll have this phrase, Pike Matchbox. So next time somebody says to you, hey, we're going to send you your file as plain text, you can look at them real hard. And after a minute, you can go, do you know Pike Matchbox? And if they say yes, it means they've seen this talk and they know about the encoding systems and they know about UTF-8 and UTF-16 and UTF-32 and combining characters in emoji and it's fine. You guys can go out and collaborate and do good stuff together. And if they say, no, I've never heard of Pike Matchbox, you be careful because they think they're sending you plain text. But as you've seen, there is no such thing as plain text. Jakuya Belarus. Thank you very much. I hope very much to be back in Minsk to do this for real next time, this, uh, time next year. Now, uh, give me a moment here. I'm just going to switch cameras and headsets and join my friend Anatoly over on the stream. And we're going to do some uh, questions and answers and stuff. So I'll see you in a second. Thank you. So, uh, right. So, uh, da, da, da. how was it, Holt? Will be there any questions? Have you ever worked with software that doesn't do Unicode in 2020? I hope Dylan will join us in a minute. So, okay, is that? You and you should be able to hear me and <laughs> Hey, Privet Anatoly. Hi Dylan. How are you? Cactella. Uh I'm good. How are you? I'm I heard that heatwave from the last year catched up with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's 35 degrees here in London, and uh, wow, yeah. Uh, also, hey, you, you can see this is this is real life. This is what my studio looks like when you're just kind of uh, looking at it, and I'm not doing cool virtual camera stuff. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, yeah. So we have the uh, the folks in the chat thinks that your talk was amazing. I think so too. So I will. Add only one. I have only one question. Have mm -hmm. you ever had problems with the passport, like your friends <laughs> from Sweden? I haven't, anyway. I, I haven't had any problems, but I have. Uh, every year, I get a visa to go and visit Russia, um, and every year when they write my name, Dylan Beatty, in Cyrillic, they write it differently. So two years ago, I was Dylan Betty, and last year I was Dylan Beatty, and one time I was Dylan Beatsy. Um, but it's never been a problem. So, and actually, I, I have a, a Russian visa this year that I don't think I'm going to use because of the whole pandemic lockdown thing. No one's traveling. Um, but no, I, I've never had a, a trouble getting across the border with with uh, with my name and my passport. Um, but my name is all ASCII, so I'm internationally compatible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> okay, so there is no there are no questions in the chat, folks. If you have questions, to oh. Have you ever worked with .NET's Rune class slash API? What uh, do you think about in regards to the dealing with raw Unicode code points? I have not worked with the .NET Rune class. The only language where I've worked with runes is uh, Go. Give me a second and just get some air in here. Um, so I worked with Go a little bit, building embedded systems for Raspberry Pis. And Go has a Rune class, which I, I, I worked with a little bit. Uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, but no, I, I don't know very much about it. I've certainly not worked with runes in .NET. And uh, what do I think about it in regards to dealing with raw Unicode code points? Um, I, just, I kind of broaden the question out a little bit because uh, one of the themes that I, I hope kind of came through in the talk today is there's a lot of things where there's a way of doing it that's very, very simple if you don't care about edge cases. 
like, you know, ASCII was a bunch of Americans going, we don't care about the rest of the world. We're going to build a system that works for us. And that was very, very influential. And, uh, you know, you look at how different languages, so there's a thing called Romaji, which is an entire um, writing system, which is for writing Japanese using ASCII. Um, and so, you know, and I, every time you're like, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to adapt to something that's easy for the computers and inconvenience people? Or are we going to try and create an experience that feels inclusive and natural for all of the people who are using our system, but becomes much more difficult to work with as developers and programmers? Um, and, you know, I think it, it's, it is every programmer should understand Unicode and everyone who's building any kind of software in 2020 should understand, you know, code points and combining characters and how emoji work and UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32. Uh, there's even a thing, there's UTF-7, which is if you need to, <laughs> UTF-7 is designed for sending Unicode in the headers of SMTP email because SMTP is only a seven bit protocol. It doesn't support eight bit text. So if you want to send like Russian email headers, you have to do them using 7-bit encoding, which is just weird. You turn it into base64, and then you wrap that inside a plus. It's, but we don't really use that very much anymore. Um, but it's important that people know about this stuff. Uh, because, as you know, the, the example there with the, um, the Chinese in the event logs from the, the uh, CRM network problem that we had, um, you know, I had no idea. Like, and, and you saw how quickly when I put that on Twitter, there were two people who knew about UTF-16. And if they hadn't had that, you know, I we could have anything. We could have ended up calling the police being like, we think there's, you know, Chinese hackers breaking into our system. Um, and one, it's because we didn't understand, none of us could read or write Chinese. None of us understood the encoding system. We didn't have the the, the knowledge to understand and diagnose what was going on in that situation and we just kind of freaked out a little bit um and so i think you know the the first rule of of anything is is look a little bit deeper like you think it's chinese but dig one level deeper have a look at the byte stream uh, does that make sense and you'd be like uh hang on zero zero forty four zero zero sixty that looks a little bit like ascii to me um and, uh, you know, it's, it's great that there are these these amazing APIs, you know, that the Unicode APIs in .NET are good. I've worked with them lots to do lots of different things. Um, I've worked with interop between uh, .NET and old, like, Visual Basic 6 COM components, where you have to turn everything into Windows code page 1252, which is horrible. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's understanding what's actually going on. There's a, you know, the, the law of leaky abstractions. It's like, hey, Unicode, you can just treat it as text right up till the point when one day you can't treat it as text because something went wrong. And at that point, you want to understand one level deeper than where you do your job. So if your job is text processing, like you're doing building web pages and spell checkers, understand the encoding systems. If you're working on encoding systems, you want to go down and understand uh, network protocols and bits and parity. If you're designing network protocols, you need to understand physical transport layers and you know hardware considerations and i think that's just a really good rule if you're working with the rune class um yeah brilliant but understand you know how would i do this if i didn't have the rune class what's the problem it's actually solving for me so we got any other any other questions i, I see we've got a, a bunch of people watching on the stream um one of the things so <laughs> yeah people are I'm just looking through the chat as well yeah yeah um, so if you have any questions to Dylan, please join him in the speaker's room. He will be there for half an hour yep. or so and answer all your questions. Don't be shy. Join with your video and audio. It's really engaging to talk to your people if we can see you and hear you. So try, do try that. Also, the fun thing the about online conferences, if anyone has questions that are about, like, how do you do something in .NET, I just bring up Visual Studio and I'll show you, and we can do it with like screen shares and stuff. So, which is also kind of yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, that's actually cool. In the meantime, we are going to the coffee break, and in ten minutes we will have Neil Stannis, the rise of software supply chain attacks, and and due to technical issues, there will be no speakers video, but we will catch him at the questions and answer part. Thank you, Dan Dylan. I really hope to see you in person. I hope so too, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See you. That's for Daniel.